The cabin had been in our family for ages, a secluded hideaway nestled in the thick Wyoming woods. Story one, far from any town, completely off the grid, it was my grandfather's prized spot, a two-story hunting retreat with creaking wooden floors and the faint scent of old smoke from countless stove fires. There was no electricity or running water, just a generator for a couple of lights and a pump for drinking water. Trips up there varied in purpose. Sometimes it was for hunting and other times it hosted family reunions where everyone gathered, made a mess and left grandpa muttering under his breath for weeks. This was our patch of wilderness, a place where the outside world was firmly left behind. This time it was just supposed to be me and my friend, Evan. We'd both been grinding away in the city and needed a break, just a few days to kick back, sip some beer, maybe do a bit of hiking or shoot at tin cans. We'd done it dozens of times, sometimes because we were already nearby for work, sometimes just to relax. That cabin never failed to deliver the quiet we both craved. The family gave us the go ahead and nobody else had claimed the cabin for that weekend. So we packed up our cooler with beer, tossed some snacks into a bag and ensured we had everything we'd need to unwind or so we thought. The cabin sat about an hour off the main road, hidden behind miles of dirt paths through dense forest. Even with GPS, most people wouldn't find it easily. If they did, they'd still face a heavy metal gate at the entrance. We arrived mid-afternoon, and the cabin looked exactly as it had the last time, solid though losing the battle against time. A layer of leaves covered the porch, and the door groaned as we pushed it open. Inside, the musty smell hit us, a mix of mildew and old wood. Evan wrinkled his nose and joked, Smells like nature's dumpster in here. Better than the city's. I shot back. We spent the next hour settling in, unloading the truck, grabbing some beers, and getting some music playing. We had a tradition of blasting whatever rock album we were into at the time, letting the forest know we had arrived. It felt good to unwind, sitting on the porch and watching light filter through the trees as the sun began to sink. There's a quiet out there that you just can't get anywhere else. No cars, no people, just the occasional bird call or rustle of leaves. It's the kind of silence that feels like the world has forgotten about you. We were halfway through the six pack when Evan mentioned the old shooting range out back. A few targets still sat near the tree line and we usually blew off steam shooting at them with whatever guns we brought along. Did you bring a rifle? I asked. Evan shook his head. Thought you were bringing it. Guess I didn't bring anything either. I sighed. He smirked. Well, there's an old BB gun inside. We can shoot cans with that, right? We both laughed. A little let down, but figured we'd make do. As the day waned, we started shooting some cans off the porch with the BB gun. It was more fun than we expected, honestly. Shadows grew longer as the sun dipped lower and we began tidying up the porch when we heard a noise out in the woods. I paused mid-sentence and Evan froze too, his hand half crushing his beer can. We both looked out toward the tree line about 50 yards away, where the dense woods swallowed up everything beyond. You hear that? I asked. Evan nodded. Yeah, and it sounded big, definitely not a small animal. We strained our eyes against the growing darkness waiting for whatever it was to show itself. A deer, maybe. But if we were unlucky, something bigger. I grabbed a flashlight off the porch railing and shined it toward the trees, scanning back and forth but saw nothing. Only the sound of something slowly moving further away, crunching through the underbrush. Probably a deer, Evan muttered, but I couldn't shake an odd feeling. Deer didn't move like that, they were quick, always darting around. Whatever this was, it was moving slowly with a sense of purpose. We shrugged it off and went back inside, cranking up the music a bit more and setting up for a game of beer pong. Another tradition. Halfway through the game, with Evan just sinking a shot, we heard a loud bang against the side of the cabin, shaking the entire structure. For a second, I thought a car had plowed into us. Both of us froze, 
ping pong balls bouncing across the table, and then it happened again, a loud slam against the wall. Jesus! Evan yelled, dropping his beer as he stood up. What was that? We had no idea, just stared at each other, bracing for another hit that might actually break through the wall. But nothing happened, and the silence that followed was eerie. Evan glanced at me, his eyes wide. We locked everything up instinctively, knowing we'd faced bears in the past. But this didn't feel like a bear. Bears didn't slam into buildings like that. Peeking through the front window, I shone my flashlight across the yard but saw nothing. Just darkness rippling slightly with the breeze. Think it's gone, Evan whispered beside me. I have no idea, I replied. Whatever hit the cabin had weight behind it. Too much weight to be anything small. But we waited, and gradually, fear turned to frustration. Evan grabbed a knife from the kitchen drawer, and I took my flashlight. We have to check this out, he said. We stepped onto the porch, shining lights into the driveway. Nothing moved, but as we neared the tree line, I saw it. A figure tall and gaunt standing unervingly still just beyond the reach of our lights. Before we could react, it moved, zigzagging in a strange, erratic pattern and making weird guttural noises, like something deranged. What the hell? Evan yelled, stumbling back as I grabbed his arm, and we both bolted back inside, locking and barricading the doors. We flipped the table and positioned it in front of the big window. I peeked outside and saw the figure just outside the light's edge, tall with scraggly hair, pale-faced and expressionless. It lingered for a moment before slipping back into the darkness. What the hell was that? Evan whispered. I had no answer. We barricaded ourselves in the loft, trying to stay alert. By the time dawn crept over the trees, neither of us had slept a wink. In the morning light, we found massive footprints outside, disappearing into the woods. Evan shook his head, and I just wanted to leave. Whatever had been out there wasn't normal. We ran to the truck, and as we rounded the cabin, we saw it. The door was open, and the truck had been ransacked. It all clicked. The figure had likely been some unhinged person from the woods, someone who saw our truck and decided to scare us into hiding so they could raid our vehicle. With a pounding heart, we sped away from that place. And to this day, we haven't returned alone. It remains a haunting memory we barely talk about. A nightmare from a night that we'll never fully understand. Monica and I had been planning this trip for years looking for something unforgettable, something that would stand out as a real adventure. We dreamed of a getaway that would leave us with stories to share years from now, far from our daily routines. The idea of being completely off the grid, just the two of us in pure solitude, sounded incredible. Once we had enough saved, we booked an extended stay in the far northern woods of Ontario, a remote place that took nearly a full day of driving to reach. We rented a small cabin from a company with a collection of rustic, A-frame hideaways scattered across the area. These cabins were simple, with heating only from a wood stove, and some lacked running water. Monica was thrilled, and I shared her excitement. It felt like stepping into an adventure book. When we finally arrived, it was exactly what we had envisioned. A small triangular cabin with big windows facing the endless forest, no neighbors in sight, just the sounds of nature all around. Towering trees surrounded us, their thick trunks giving the impression we were completely isolated from the outside world. The air was clean and crisp, and Monica beamed as she stepped out of the car, stretching her arms and taking in the calm around us. The cabin itself was charmingly basic, a small bedroom, a kitchen with a two-burner stove and a mini-fridge, and a cozy living room that doubled as a dining area. There was a fireplace with plenty of wood, a single faucet with water from a nearby well, and a small front porch. The company had promised a no-frills, back-to-nature experience, 
and they delivered. Our first day was spent exploring the area, walking along a stream, snapping photos of the trees and distant mountains. Truly felt like we had stepped into a postcard. As evening set in, we made our way back to the cabin, invigorated by the fresh air and the feeling of being far removed from everyday life. We had brought some wine with us, and that night we cooked a simple pasta meal, the kind we'd had countless times before, but somehow it tasted better here. The quiet around us made everything seem special, just the crackle of the fire and the occasional chirping of crickets breaking the silence. After dinner, we cleared up and took the wine into the bedroom, ready to end the day in peace. But as we settled in, a faint noise broke the stillness. At first, it sounded like the soft creak of settling wood. I paused, glancing at Monica, who had already started to undress. Did you hear that? I asked. She looked up, a bit startled. Then it came again, louder this time. The unmistakable sound of footsteps, slow and purposeful, crossing the porch outside. The floorboards creaked under the weight, and I felt the vibrations through the thin walls around us. Monica froze, her shirt still halfway off. Someone's outside, she whispered, her face pale. My first thought was that maybe it was the owner stopping by to check on us or make sure everything was fine. But why now? It was nearly 9 p.m. and they hadn't knocked. I slipped out of bed, heart pounding, and tiptoed to the window. I peeked through the curtains, scanning the porch and the yard beyond. Nothing not a hint of movement, but the sound had been unmistakable. I then moved to the door, unlocked it, and opened it just a crack. A cold night breeze greeted me, sending a chill down my spine. I stepped out onto the porch, my bare feet pressing against the wood. Fresh muddy boot prints led right up to the door and then stopped, no other tracks suggesting they'd left. Quickly, I shut the door and locked it. Monica sat up in bed, her face drained. What did you see? She asked, her voice barely a whisper. Footprints, I said, swallowing hard. Someone was definitely here. For the next hour, we debated whether to stay or leave. Monica was understandably shaken, and so was I. But the more we talked, the more we convinced ourselves it could have been innocent. Maybe someone got lost or confused about the cabins. The company had mentioned that people occasionally wandered near the area by mistake. In the end, we decided to stay. We'd invested so much into this trip. Besides, whoever it was seemed to be gone. The next morning felt normal again. We spent the day fishing in the stream, laughing at our lack of skill, and even discovered a small cave nearby with old footprints inside. Oddly, it made us feel less alone though after the previous night, it was unsettling too. As the day ended and the temperature dropped, we retreated to the cabin, cooked dinner, drank some wine, and played music on a small speaker, relishing the warmth. But as night fell, the eerie sense of unease returned. By the time we made it to the bedroom, the cabin seemed too quiet, too tense. We tried to ignore it, focusing on each other, but then we heard it again. Footsteps, heavier this time, crossing the porch. I froze, my heart pounding, and glanced at Monica, who was staring wide-eyed at the door. Without thinking, I slipped to the doorway, peeking into the main room, just in time to see the front door creak open. My blood turned to ice as two figures, dressed in dark clothes, slipped silently inside. They moved as if they knew the place, one heading toward the kitchen, the other toward the living room. I backed into the bedroom, shut the door quietly, and locked it, hands shaking. Monica's face went pale as I whispered, two men just came in. She covered her mouth to stifle a gasp, and I motioned for silence. We need to get out, I whispered. Through the window, if we reach the car, we'll be safe. But before we could make a move, the sounds of movement filled the room outside. Footsteps paced slowly across the common area, right near our door. Then, I heard the bathroom door creak open, 
and the faint clink of items in our toiletry bag. My skin crawled as I realized they were inspecting our belongings. Images flashed in my mind of them signaling to each other, realizing someone was in the cabin. Suddenly, the footsteps retreated and the front door creaked as it closed. The silence that followed was nauseating. I was convinced they were trying to lure us out. I held my breath, waiting, ears straining for any sound, but all I could hear was the wind outside. Carefully, I crept to the window and peered out. I could just make out two figures moving into the forest, vanishing into the darkness. Without wasting a second, Monica and I packed our bags quickly and quietly, stuffing everything in as fast as possible. We bolted to the car, barely daring to breathe until we were on the road. I kept glancing in the mirror, half expecting to see them behind us, but the road was empty. Then, just as we neared the main highway, we noticed a distant glow, a campfire. Monica's voice was tense. What is that? She asked, and I shook my head. Let's not find out. Once back in town, we called the company to report what had happened. Their response felt rehearsed, as though they'd heard it before. We received a refund and a voucher for another stay, but the whole experience left us shaken. Monica and I ended up sitting at a diner, unable to shake the unease. A few months later, I saw an article about a couple who had gone missing in that very area, not far from our cabin. Their abandoned car was found at a trailhead, and in the background of the article's photo was a blurry pickup truck with two figures nearby. The stillness of those figures gave me chills. It was impossible to tell who they were, but I knew in my gut it was them. After that, Monica and I crossed that cabin from our bucket list and kept a close eye on the news for months. We learned that the couple was never found, and there had been other incidents of vandalism reported in the area. What was more disturbing, though, was that the same company had dismissed an employee right before the break-in started. That employee had disappeared from town after being fired. Though I didn't have all the answers, it seemed too much to be a coincidence. Back when I was in university, I had a buddy whose father owned about 750 acres in northern Louisiana. Years earlier, he'd rented it out to hunters and lumber companies but hadn't done so in a while. He'd built a small cabin on the land a few years before, which he occasionally let us use to unwind. It was the perfect escape from the daily grind of college and a chance to enjoy nature. So, during spring break of 1996, we loaded up our vehicles and headed to the cabin with plans to go shooting, drink some beers, and do the usual things country kids enjoy in the woods. The first morning, we were busy getting the cabin cleaned up and organizing our gear. By evening, we had a large fire going outside and grilled up a meal of steaks and fried potatoes. Dessert got skipped, and the beers came out soon after. By the time the sun went down, we were all pretty buzzed and passed around a joint or two. Later in the night, I heard a strange noise outside, so I went to check. The fire was just a faint glow, but in the shadows, I thought I saw the outline of someone standing still, as though they were watching me. I squinted, trying to see clearer, but the shadows and my unsteady eyes made it difficult. The figure didn't move, so, fueled by a mix of nerves and curiosity, I took a few steps closer, hoping to see better. As I moved forward, I was interrupted by my friend's voice from behind. He'd woken up, saw the door open, and came out to find me wandering around. His voice startled me, but I quickly recognized him. I asked if he saw the figure near the fire, but he just laughed, saying I was probably imagining things. We both laughed it off and went back inside, but I turned around once more for another look. The figure was gone, and I chuckled to myself before heading to bed. The following day, I dismissed it as a drunken hallucination and went on with our plans. We spent the morning fishing in a large pond, 
followed by some target shooting in the afternoon, and after dinner, we broke out the cards for poker, which quickly devolved into more stories around the fire. Later that night, on one of my trips to relieve myself, a snapping branch nearby spooked me, and I hurried back to the fire, my nervous face making my friends laugh. They reminded me we weren't the only creatures in these woods, and their reasoning seemed sound enough to calm me down. Later, while deep in conversation, I turned to speak to the guy next to me and froze. Standing a few feet behind him was a man I didn't recognize, staring right at my friend's head as if trying to drill into it with his eyes. My friend, oblivious, continued talking. I realized it was the same figure from the night before, average height with a wild, scruffy beard. The man eventually looked over at me with a blank stare and then turned to walk away. When my friend noticed my shock, I blurted out what I'd seen, but everyone just laughed, dismissing it as nonsense. They joked about Bigfoot sightings, and though I protested, no one believed me. Frustrated, I stopped talking, but inside, I was more determined than ever to prove he was real. Over the next two days, nothing unusual happened, and I kept my eyes peeled. By the fourth morning, I started to question my own sanity. I'd seen him twice, and now he'd disappeared. I decided to put my curiosity aside, at least until something else happened. That afternoon, my friend's dad mentioned that a neighbor had spotted a pack of wild hogs on his land. So we grabbed our rifles and set out to find them. After a few miles down the main road, we found tracks and began following them on foot. A mile or so later, we stumbled upon three large hogs rooting in the dirt and prepared to take our shots. I was counting down in my head to pull the trigger when the loud crack of another rifle rang out, shattering a branch above my friend's head. A moment later, another shot followed, even closer. Not waiting for a third, we took off down a trail toward the cabin, the friend who had been targeted leading the way. The shots didn't continue as we ran, but we didn't stop until we reached my truck and sped out of there. This was before cell phones were common, so we drove the 15 miles to town to get help. Once we found the sheriff, we returned to the property with a couple of deputies. We approached carefully, staying in the cars and watched, waiting for any sign of the shooter. There was nothing. After a brief inspection, we found a few bullet holes in the cabin and my friend's truck windshield. Strangely, all our camping supplies were strewn about, with only a box of ammunition and my sleeping bag missing. The deputies speculated we might have stumbled upon a poacher or squatter who'd been hiding on the property. My friend's dad, concerned, insisted they search the land thoroughly. I repeated my story of seeing the stranger, and finally it was taken seriously. The search took place while we were back at school, continuing for over a week. They found a few old camps, but no trace of the man. It was assumed he'd fled after the shooting incident, sensing authorities would soon be on his trail. From then on, we didn't go back to that property. A year later, we tried camping somewhere else, but it wasn't the same, and we eventually stopped our trips altogether. Within five years, my friend's dad suffered a heart attack and lost interest in the land, leasing it out again for logging. Now, whenever I write down memories of those trips, I can't help but think of that strange, terrifying week that ended them. My old friend and I still talk occasionally, and he confirms that the mystery figure was never caught. We joke about the stranger's origins, but I often wonder, especially late at night, if he's still out there, waiting for a chance to finish what he started all those years ago. In 2019, after years of envisioning it, I finally left the busy city. I'd always dreamed of escaping the crowds, traffic, and noise. The pandemic was the final push I needed to stop dreaming and make it real. After some serious planning, I purchased a few acres way off the beaten path. In a place so remote I barely got a phone signal, yet close enough to town for necessary supplies. My goal was ambitious. 
I plan to build a cabin powered by solar panels, complete with a rainwater silo and chicken coop. For now, the cabin was a far-off idea. First, I had to clear the dense, pine-filled land. Every weekend, I loaded up my truck and headed out there, sometimes alone, sometimes with a friend. Clearing out enough space for a foundation was a big job. I wasn't in a hurry. Figured I'd take a few years, saving money while gradually working on the project. Saturdays were spent cutting through the underbrush, tackling thick vines and shrubs. Though tiring, it felt refreshing. The air was clean, and the only sounds were the wind and occasional crow, far from the city's endless sirens and car horns. One weekend in late autumn, I went solo since my buddy Jake had other plans. My goal that day was to map out the cabin's foundation. I arrived around midday and started working immediately. The hours flew by in a mix of sweat and sawdust. By evening, with blistered hands and sore muscles, I felt proud of my progress. I'd cleared a nice patch of land and had a rough outline of where the cabin might sit. Too tired to set up camp, I rolled out my sleeping bag in the truck bed instead. Under the stars, I felt content and secure with my sandwiches, a couple of beers, and my pistol at my side. I didn't expect any visitors, no one was around for miles. I cracked open a beer and relaxed, enjoying the quiet until, out of nowhere, I noticed a line of lights in the distance. I first thought they were fireflies but soon realized they were too bright and organized. They moved in a line, slowly weaving through the trees. I sat up and squinted. There were at least ten of them, moving silently from beyond the field. They didn't appear to be on my property, but I couldn't shake the unease I felt. There were no nearby roads or trails. Who were they and what were they doing here? Curiosity got the best of me. I grabbed my pistol, crept through the shadows, and approached. Around 100 feet away, I stopped. The group was now in a loose circle in an open part of the field, gazing skyward. I strained to listen, but all I heard was the wind in the trees. Unease turned into dread as I watched. Then suddenly they began chanting a low, rhythmic song. I almost convinced myself it was some group stargazing trip, but they were all adults and it just didn't add up. After slowly retreating to my truck, I kept an eye on them from a distance. Later, as I finally started to drift off, I noticed movement along the tree line. More figures darting between the trees. My heart pounded. Flicking on my truck's headlights, I watched them scatter into the forest. Relieved, I tried to relax but spent the night on edge, reaching for my gun at every snap of a twig. The following weekend, Jake came along. I told him everything, and he agreed it sounded strange. We worked throughout the day, but as night fell, we couldn't shake the feeling something might happen again. Sure enough, just as darkness settled, we heard it. A faint rustling far off in the trees. With flashlights and lanterns in hand, the same group appeared, following the same path to that field. This time, I got closer, hiding behind a tree just 40 feet away. The humming grew louder, reverberating through the night. Jake moved to another tree, but the group suddenly stopped and pointed colored lights toward the sky, clicking them in an eerie, patterned sequence. The sight made my skin crawl. Just then, Jake stepped on a branch, and the loud snap alerted the group, sending several of them running toward us. They reached us quickly. I was tackled, and Jake struggled to break free. As I fought them off, I looked up and saw a bright red light hovering just above the trees, pulsating like hot metal. It wasn't a star or a plane, much too close and bright. Two men pinned me down, but I managed to shake them off and fire a shot in the air. The noise was deafening, and for a moment, everything froze. The group stared upward, seemingly entranced by the red light above. Then they scattered disappearing back into the forest. Jake asked, was that a drone? I couldn't answer, still watching the light as it drifted upward and vanished. We walked back to the truck in stunned silence, packed up, 
and left. After a few weeks, and even after talking with local authorities, Jake and I returned to the property. Nothing strange happened again. I eventually continued my cabin project alone, and three years later, no one has appeared on the land since. It was early October in eastern Montana. Fall had arrived in the hills, and with it, archers eager to hunt bighorn sheep. My cousin, whom I'll call Hank for anonymity, was a dedicated hunter. He had traveled across the continent, chasing after game, black bears in Canada, wild boar in Florida, mountain goats in Colorado, but his preferred hunting ground was the Klein Mountain Range in eastern Montana. Our family has hunted in those hills for generations knowing each riverbed and cliff as well as some know their own streets. Mountain goats are fascinating creatures. They live high above the timberline in rocky landscapes and are astonishingly nimble, navigating nearly vertical cliffs. Pursuing them requires venturing into dangerous areas where one slip or loose rock could mean you might never return. Hank, a seasoned mountain hunter, was made for this terrain. Hank decided to hunt around the Red River area in Klein, a place familiar to the locals and well-known for its mountain goat population. The first mile of his hike went smoothly as he climbed through the canyon. The air was cold and fresh, his breath forming in the chilly morning as he advanced. The sun had just begun to crest the hills when Hank spotted a narrow animal trail, a potential shortcut off his usual path. He decided to follow it. A few minutes up this trail, he noticed something strange. A man stepped out from behind a tree. The man, wearing a faded denim jacket and jeans, had a small backpack slung over his shoulder. Hank paused, puzzled at where this man had come from. The stranger waved with both arms, one hand holding an older-style hunting bow. Hank returned the wave. Although the man appeared physically well, Something in his expression seemed deeply troubled. The man shouted something, though Hank couldn't make it out, and motioned for him to follow. Hank didn't sense any danger from the man and felt he genuinely needed help. So Hank began making his way up the canyon, trailing the stranger. Oddly, he couldn't seem to get closer. The man was always just far enough ahead to prevent any real conversation. Occasionally, the stranger would stop glanced back to ensure Hank was still following, his face showing clear concern. Hank stayed calm and tried to keep a reassuring smile, though he had no idea where he was being led or to whom. Hank found the situation curious. He hadn't noticed any other vehicles along the road to the trailhead. Perhaps the man had come from another direction, but what could he possibly need help with? Hank speculated one of his hunting companions might have been injured, Though if that were true, why wouldn't the man simply stop and explain? Rounding a bend, Hank lost sight of the stranger for a moment. The trail opened into a steep, rocky slope. He searched around but saw no sign of the man until he heard a whistle. Looking up, Hank saw the stranger about 400 feet up the slope, waving. There was no way he could have climbed that far in such a short time. Yet. Hank felt no fear, only curiosity. Now, the man was urgently beckoning him to follow. Hank sighed and began the slow, challenging climb. Every other step dislodged small rocks, causing him to struggle for footing. Breathing hard in the thin air, he finally reached a small ledge nearly 40 minutes later, where he had last seen the man. But the stranger was gone. As he caught his breath, Hank noticed something odd nearby, a worn boot poking out from beneath a large rock with another boot beside it. Inside them and under the rock lay bones. Scanning his surroundings again for any sign of the man, Hank felt a peculiar sense of peace, as though he were picking up emotions not his own, but from all around him. Marking the spot with his GPS, Hank headed down the trail and contacted authorities. The county sheriff's office responded, and he led them back up to the site. 
It took four men to move the boulder, revealing skeletal remains beneath. Alongside the bones were hunting gear and some personal items. Using a credit card found in the wallet, they identified the body, a bow hunter who had vanished almost exactly 54 years earlier. Hank chose to remain anonymous to the public and the missing hunter's family, not wanting recognition. To him, it was just one of those eerie stories that happen out in the mountains. He was glad the family received closure, even decades later. The only thing that unsettled him was the man who had led him there and disappeared so suddenly. He mentioned the mysterious stranger to the sheriff but didn't dwell on it. When the discovery made the news, a few old photos of the missing hunter were included. Hank was stunned. The man in those images was the same one who had guided him up the mountain to the body. Finally, he understood the distressed look, the glances to see if he was following, the sense of relief when the remains were found. The man had only wanted to go home, and, through Hank, he finally had. The following story is entirely true. The years noted here are approximate, as it's been a long time since this all happened. For me, this was one of the rare times I truly questioned what I was seeing and even my own sanity. I'm writing it down now because it's a story I think others can learn from. In a town about two hours south of Madison, on the edge of Wisconsin, there was a local park in the middle of the neighborhood with a small wooded area around it, roughly three or four acres. In the early 1990s, around 1992 or 1993, I first heard about the mysterious woman in white who haunted that little patch of woods. Back then, I was just a kid in fourth grade hanging around after school when one of my friends brought up the legend. It was a classic ghost story. There was a rumor that a child had vanished shortly after a sighting of the lady in white, a spirit that locals believed was a woman dressed head to toe in pale clothing. According to the tale, this disappearance had happened in 1986, though no one knew who the child was. Another friend then added that a grown man had also gone missing a few years after another sighting of the same ghost. Both times, the sightings reportedly occurred well past midnight after the park had closed. The park sat between residential areas, and there were stories of families moving away after seeing the woman in the woods. Over time, rumors escalated, linking the ghost with witchcraft, occult activities, and even rituals. A few months later, another kid in my class discovered a crudely painted pentagram on a tree along one of the park's trails, deepening the mystery. We biked over to see it ourselves. It was definitely there, hastily drawn. We didn't know if it was part of the ghost story or if someone had just added it because of the tale. But at that age, we didn't care much about the reason. We just knew it was creepy. In the spring of 1994, a friend named Danny, who lived just a block away from the park, hosted a sleepover for his birthday, inviting about 10 of us. Danny knew every version of the ghost story and had heard even more from an older neighbor. Late that night, just past midnight, one of the boys dared us all to sneak out and find the ghost. With a mix of excitement and fear, we did just that. We crept out of Danny's house and made our way over to the park. Once there, we split up. A few of the boys headed toward the abandoned Little League Diamond. Others wandered over by the playground. I stayed near the parking lot with another friend, keeping an eye out for anything unusual. We'd only been there for 15 or 20 minutes when something strange happened. There, deep in the trees to the north, stood what looked like a pale woman, her clothes almost glowing white under the moonlight. Her white hair and flowing clothing gave her a ghostly look, fitting every description we'd ever heard of the lady in white. That moment remains the scariest I've ever experienced, even compared to later incidents like a car accident. Every one of us saw her. She stood out so clearly in the dark that there was no mistaking it. Without a word, we all bolted for Danny's house, sprinting faster than we ever had. We didn't look back. 
I could exaggerate and say she chased us or did something terrifying, but honestly, she barely moved. She seemed lost in thought, almost as if she was looking deeper into the woods and not even noticing us. We made it back to Danny's house in one piece, but that night we were sure we'd been face to face with a ghost. We told everyone at school, and soon the lady in the woods was our own local legend. Even one of our teachers listened patiently when we recounted the story, though she quickly changed the subject. Over the years, the story took on a life of its own, and we had the ultimate ghost tale to share around campfires. Time passed, and as we moved from elementary school to junior high, then high school, we gradually forgot about the ghost story. By then, girls and other teenage concerns had taken its place. A few of us would still talk about it sometimes, but by high school, the story was mainly just a childhood memory. Tragically, one of the boys from that sleepover took his own life not long after high school. I couldn't help but think of the ghost story, but I knew it wasn't the cause. Years later, around 2009, after college, I moved back to my hometown and ended up buying a small house just a couple of streets from that same park. I now had a job, a wife, and even a couple of kids. I'd walk my dog in that park, often thinking back to that night with the lady in white. Standing there, staring at the same trees, I wondered how much of it had been real. Could ten kids all have shared the same imagination, or was there something truly there? In 2011, during one of my usual dog walks, I ran into a man moving items from his house into a trailer parked near the park's edge. He mentioned that he just sold the house, which had belonged to his parents. He was preparing for the final move out and I don't know why, but I felt the urge to ask him if he'd ever heard the ghost story. I barely knew how to bring it up, but somehow, I found myself recounting a shortened version of our tale from that night. He listened patiently, and when I finished, he looked at me and nodded. Oh, I've heard about that ghost, all right, he said to my surprise. He then paused as if carefully choosing his words. You know, that wasn't a ghost. That was my mom. I stared at him, stunned. She had some health issues in the 80s, he continued, and the medication made her sleepwalk. Many nights, the police would call me because they'd found her wandering in the park, dressed in her white nightgown. He explained how she often wore a long, pale robe and white gloves. To anyone who didn't know better, she'd look ghostly, especially under the park's old streetlight. I stood there, realizing that the ghost we'd feared all those years had simply been this man's mother, unknowingly turned into a legend by her own nighttime wanderings. It felt surreal knowing she'd been a real person with a story of her own. Though I never saw that man again, I sometimes wonder if children in that town still share stories about the woman in white. A part of me hopes they do because, in a way, it's as if she lives on as a memory in that park. Today, I've moved to a different town and rarely visit my old neighborhood. I never did learn her real name, and I often regret not asking that man more questions. But I still think of her from time to time. It reminds me that every story, no matter how strange, can have a real-life origin. There's a reason why I always need some convincing to go camping whenever it comes up with friends or family. I don't mind the outdoors or being in nature, but I do prefer sleeping in a bed instead of on the ground in a tent. This particular year, my boyfriend managed to talk me into going camping again, but this time we'd be staying in a cabin with an actual bed. I had wanted to go to the beach, but at least I'd be getting a proper night's sleep. Our group included my boyfriend, me, and two other couples. The six of us rented a cozy cabin in the woods, mostly secluded, with a lovely lake just a short walk away for swimming. I didn't want to admit it, but I was actually excited about this trip once we got there. The first day was perfect. We spent hours on nearby trails, swimming in the lake, and later on we grilled some burgers in the early evening. It was a fantastic first day. 
That night, we all turned in around midnight, though I didn't sleep well. I kept hearing strange sounds outside, which I tried to ignore, reminding myself that we were out in the woods, where odd noises aren't unusual. The next morning, we were getting ready to go hiking when we heard a cheerful voice call from behind. Hey, how's everyone doing today? My boyfriend, who's always chatty, started talking with him right away. The man introduced himself as Daryl and said he knew all the trails around here. The interaction was a bit odd, but not exactly alarming. Daryl said he lived close by, heard us, and wanted to check if we were settling in all right. I thought it was kind of nice of him to stop by. He was a big man, well over six feet tall, with a large build. He was dressed in hiking boots, jeans, and a backpack, so he just looked like a typical hiker from the area. We thanked him, and he chuckled warmly as he went on his way. As we hiked, we laughed a bit about Daryl. Later that afternoon, we decided to spend a few hours at the lake, relaxing on the dock and soaking up the sun. Suddenly, from beyond the trees, we heard his voice again. There they are. We all jumped. It was startling to see Daryl again, now standing at the dock's edge. We asked him what he was doing, and he said he was just out wandering and saw us. My boyfriend brushed it off, chatting with him a bit, but I could see Tina's boyfriend and I were both uneasy. Daryl kept nodding, chuckling, and glancing around the whole time they talked. Once the conversation ended, he muttered, all right, under his breath and walked off. It was odd, but not exactly scary, at least not yet. That night, we were sitting around the campfire, telling scary stories, when out of nowhere, Daryl jumped out from the bushes, shouting, here I am, with a booming laugh. We all nearly jumped out of our seats, even more than at the lake. At this point, my boyfriend was irritated and firmly told Daryl to leave us alone and head back to his place. He said that startling us wasn't funny and that Daryl was lucky we hadn't reacted out of fear. Daryl looked a bit hurt, claiming he was just trying to add to our trip's fun. He then walked back onto one of the trails, seeming upset. I almost felt bad for him, but it was late. No reasonable person would be lurking around our camp at that hour. This encounter left us all a bit on edge, and we soon called it a night. We went inside and tidied up since we planned to leave early the next day. When we got to bed, I told my boyfriend I had a bad feeling about Daryl, almost as if he might show up again. I couldn't shake the thought that the odd noises I heard the night before might have been him. I was wide awake again, and at some point, I distinctly heard footsteps and breathing outside the window. I woke my boyfriend and asked him to look. He was annoyed at first, but his tone shifted instantly after glancing outside. He turned pale and whispered that he saw someone pacing outside the cabin, likely Daryl. I carefully peeked out, trying not to draw attention, and saw Daryl mumbling to himself and acting erratically. He seemed to try the door but found it locked and started hitting his own head, visibly frustrated. After a few minutes of pacing, he wandered back into the woods. We were terrified and unsure of what to do, so we called the cabin owner and notified the police. When an officer arrived, we recounted the events, including Daryl's visits. The officer listened but didn't seem especially concerned, nodding as though he didn't grasp the seriousness. We packed up, made coffee, and stayed up until dawn. As soon as the sun rose, we loaded up the van and left. When we got to the main road, we saw Daryl walking by himself, muttering and occasionally hitting his head. We called the dispatcher and reported that we had just seen the man who had tried to break in last night. After that, I don't know what happened. I'm not sure if the police ever picked him up or if he just wandered off again. I'm relieved nothing happened to us, but I've decided from now on, my friends can go camping without me. This is a true story that I found myself fixating on, thinking about everything that happened out there. 
I'll try to keep it short, but will include all the main details. My wife's uncle, Rob, bought some land a bit north of Kerr Delane, Idaho, with an old family friend. They got it at a big discount due to pollution from an old factory in the area, which had ruined the soil and made the underground water unusable. They divided the land into two lots, each with a small camper to live in. Over time, Rob grew increasingly paranoid, often claiming that people were watching him from the forest. Around three months after moving there, a man wandered through the woods and encountered Rob. The situation escalated, leading the man to break Rob's jaw. When arrested, the man claimed he felt an overwhelming urge to see if he could kill him. Two months later, Rob was murdered while asleep on the couch in his camper. Our cousin Ben found him, and after the initial shock, he fled, eventually stopping to call the police. There was enough evidence to catch the killer quickly. A 19-year-old boy who claimed he only wanted his bike back. He'd beaten Rob to death with a heavy tool found nearby, causing fatal injuries. After that, Ben was terrified of being alone on the property. He moved in with relatives for about eight months but eventually had no other options and had to return. Constantly on edge, he managed to convince my wife and me to come and stay with him. The moment I turned off the main road onto the land, an overwhelming feeling of dread hit me. Hundreds of crows filled the dirt road leading up to the campsite. I didn't sleep a wink that first night, watching the forest, sensing something deeply wrong. The whole area had an eerie energy, and I thought it might be because of Rob's death. Even in daylight, it felt like something was watching us, and my wife and I always felt uneasy, especially after dark. Things settled down for a while until Ben started feeling lightheaded and nauseous frequently. I took him to the hospital where they said it was likely just a flu. The anniversary of Rob's death passed, but three days later, Ben ran out of his camper unable to breathe, waking us with his cries. He got into his car, floored the gas and crashed into a tree. I rushed to the window and saw pure terror in his eyes. He was gasping, clutching his chest, and then he let out one last breath. I tried CPR until emergency services arrived, but he was gone. On July 10th, exactly one year and three days after moving there, Rob and Ben were both dead. My wife and I were now alone on the property, waking up each day, haunted by the unexplained events around us. We should have left immediately, but somehow we stayed. One day, I went to fill a water jug and was hit with a terrible smell. Inside the water drum, which had a small opening, were pieces of chipmunks, heads, spines, all torn apart. As nights went by, the feeling of dread only grew. I never saw anything but constantly felt watched, hearing footsteps and branches snapping nightly. I grew up in the mountains of Montana, so being alone in the woods wasn't new to me, but this was different. One night, my wife and I came back with a feeling that something was wrong. Nothing was out of place, yet everything felt off. Then, we noticed a scruffy orange cat sitting on a tree stump, its eyes almost glowing in the dim light. Suddenly, a voice echoed through the trees, sounding like a child calling for help. My wife responded, but the voice sounded distorted, like something wasn't right. We called back, but there was no answer. Then, the voice screamed, shrill and unsettling, leaving us shaken. My wife wanted to help, but I held her back, sensing something was wrong. I convinced her to get back in the truck as I grabbed a flashlight. Slowly, we drove down the road, calling out. The voice sounded closer, but as we moved forward, it felt like it was coming from all around us. I stopped the truck, and the voice suddenly shouted right beside us, Help me! My ears rang from the volume, and I floored the gas, speeding out of there. When we reached the highway, I called the police. They investigated but found no trace of anyone. The next day, we returned briefly to pack our things, and my wife gave birth shortly afterward. We never went back to that place after our baby was born. 
To this day, I can't explain the things we experienced out there. I never believed in the paranormal before, but after everything that happened, I'm left wondering. I've lived in Maine for most of my life and always felt at ease in the woods. Being in nature has a calming effect on me, and I've rarely had any fear while out there, especially during the day. The region doesn't have much to worry about wildlife-wise. While I'm not the quietest walker, I'm very conscious of my own sounds and the noises of the forest. There have been a few instances where everything went silent around me, but if I stopped moving, the forest sounds would usually resume in under a minute. Twice, though, I experienced an overwhelming silence that made me feel deeply uncomfortable. The first time was around 2014, while hiking with my girlfriend at the time on MT Blue. There's a particular section of the trail that's quite remarkable. The woods open up slightly, with moss covering most of the ground in sight. While hiking through this area, Everything became completely quiet, and we both stopped. She asked if I had noticed it, and I admitted that something felt strange, though I brushed it off, joking that it might just be me breathing heavily. We started walking again with her ahead, but the silence persisted, and I kept getting this sensation that someone was watching us. This section of the trail shouldn't take more than 30 minutes, but it felt like time slowed to a standstill. Eventually, we reached a trail intersection and stopped. About 30 feet ahead, we both saw someone dash across the trail and hide behind a narrow, dead tree. They partially poked their head out and then withdrew behind the tree. It would have been challenging for anyone larger than a child to hide behind it. Without thinking, I walked past my girlfriend, heading toward the tree to check. I looked around and saw nothing. Almost immediately, it felt like the forest came back to life. I returned to her and we talked about the experience. We both felt that part of the trail took longer than it should have, with an unsettling silence that made us feel observed. We both saw someone run behind the tree and peer out, though neither of us could make sense of it, so we ended up laughing it off. We continued up to the peak, had a meal, and relaxed before descending without further incident. I've hiked that trail many times since, but nothing similar has ever occurred. The second time was in late 2018 behind my place, which had a large wooded area. The closest road was about three miles to the east, with woods stretching for miles north and south. I was about a mile in, walking one afternoon, with the forest alive with birds, squirrels, and chipmunks preparing for winter. Suddenly, everything went quiet. I paused, expecting the sounds to return as usual, thinking maybe I'd caused the silence by stepping on leaves and twigs. I then heard something moving nearby, stopping somewhere behind me. I looked around but saw nothing. The silence held. I walked a bit farther and stopped again, and once more heard something moving off in the distance, halting whenever I stopped. I repeated this a few more times with the same result. Growing uneasy, I decided to cut north to follow a ravine westward. After I exited the ravine, I paused again, but the woods remained silent. Then I heard something descending with heavy footsteps through the leaves. I immediately sprinted in a zigzag pattern all the way back to my place. I've returned to the woods since, but nothing like that has happened again. Officially, they say we don't have mountain lions here and I'd like to think I'd know if it were a bear or a coyote. What do you think? Have you ever experienced the woods going silent like that? This is always the one that unsettles people the most for some reason. To give a quick background, I was raised in a forest in a small cabin in the Smoky Mountains. Our house was more like a rundown shelter, and behind it loomed a steep hill. The nearest neighbors were close by, but with the woods in between, it felt like we were isolated. 
My parents played in a band and would leave once or twice a week from around 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. for practice or gigs. I was about 12 and my little brother was six or seven. We would kill time watching old VHS tapes or chatting. One evening, my parents left and a heavy rainstorm rolled in. If you've ever been to Tennessee, you know floods can occur suddenly. I had lost several pets to drowning from being outside in storms. We had a small enclosed porch where my mom's favorite dog, Rufus, was tied with a long chain around a toolbox. It wasn't the best way to secure him, but it worked. We didn't have much money. Rufus was goofy and not the best guard dog, but he had a loud bark, and my parents hoped he would scare off intruders. He was resting quietly on the porch until a fierce wind howled, causing the front door to fly off its hinges. Rufus darted into the night. I shouted to my brother, I'll go get him. I slipped on my dad's rubber boots and rushed outside, leaving without a flashlight because, well, I was just a careless kid. I was terrified for his safety, especially in the downpour and I knew I'd get in big trouble if my parents found out their dog was gone. Lightning flashed, illuminating the yard just enough for me to see Rufus racing down the slope and across the stream behind our cabin toward the mountain. I chased after him. The creek had a makeshift bridge, a narrow wooden plank. I didn't even step on it but leapt over, adrenaline surging through me. When the lightning faded, I could only hear Rufus by the sound of his dragging chain. In maybe 30 or 40 seconds, I was drenched from the rain, every inch of me soaked. I ran deeper into the woods, losing the sound of Rufus and panicking about my lost dog in the storm. I mindlessly scrambled up the slick leaves, calling for him and making kissy noises like you do to call a dog. Then out of nowhere, I felt a shadow descend. I can't quite explain it. I couldn't see anything, but the darkness around me thickened. Suddenly, I noticed an unusual smell, intensified by the rain. It was a pungent mix, wet dog, dead leaves, and dog urine. Surprisingly, that gave me hope. I thought maybe Rufus was out marking his territory, and I might find him. But the deepening darkness felt threatening. I stopped calling out feeling anxious as if something else was present in the forest with me. Growing up near the Smokies, I had heard many stories about what goes bump in the night. We had everything from goat men to wild people, inbred ghouls and wendigos, backpacking serial killers, you name it. I didn't know what I was listening for. Maybe a whistle, a voice or someone calling my name, but my mind raced with all the myths I had absorbed over the years. Nothing but silence greeted me. But then I caught a whiff of something from above, a stench so foul, it resembled a carcass that had been rotting in the southern heat all day. I nearly gagged, and my anxiety turned into real fear. I recognized the smell of bears and other animals. This was different, an ancient, decaying stench from something that hadn't existed in a long time. I couldn't hear any footsteps, but I sensed something moving toward me a strange vertigo setting in. My body was frozen in fear, staring into the nothingness, smelling the rot and feeling hunted. I had been stalked by a mountain lion once, and this felt almost identical but with an added layer of sheer terror. The torrential rain made it hard to breathe. I was utterly paralyzed. Then, another lightning flash illuminated the trees around me, revealing a vast black void ahead. While I could see clearly around me, in front, it was as if someone had painted over the entire forest. Just then, I heard Rufus barking, suddenly appearing out of nowhere from my right, barking wildly and running toward that dark spot. The lightning faded, and panic surged through me. Now it knew we were there. I instinctively doved down, grabbed Rufus, and clutched the long chain before he could wander too far. The rain was still deafening, and I figured nobody else could hear his barking but me. Next to him, I heard a low, guttural noise from above, a growl that rumbled like an earthquake, deep and unsettling. Every hair on my body stood on end. I took off, 
convinced I'd have to drag the dog all the way down the hill, but he seemed to be on the same page. I have no idea how we made it through the forest without crashing into any trees, racing downhill at a steep angle over slick leaves. It felt like we were superheroes for a moment, superheroes who would have lost control if we dared to look back. Somehow, I managed to keep up with Rufus in my dad's clunky boots, which showed just how scared we were. It was pure animal instinct that drove us. We crossed the bridge, my footsteps echoing loudly, and I thought, wow, that was loud. We made it back into the cabin, and I secured Rufus, who was soaked and shivering, looking guilty for his reckless escape. I rushed inside, grabbed a hammer, and tried to fix the door as best as I could. It was just a rickety cabin, so our lock was basically a piece of wood wedged with a nail. I changed into dry clothes and sat down, too shaken to say much. My brother was exhausted and quiet. It was late. He wanted to watch a movie, but I stopped him. I still felt uneasy. We turned off the lights. Trust me, it felt less frightening this way because with the lights on, the outside was pitch black, and it felt like someone could be watching us. We sat in the dark living room, peering out the picture window at our drenched yard. Nothing was visible, but flickering shadows hinted that something was off. Whenever lightning struck, there would be a mass, either far or near, that didn't illuminate properly. I took a flashlight and shone it outside, but the beam seemed to be cut off, swallowed by dark patches. Rufus, who typically barked at the slightest movement, was eerily silent. Meanwhile, our roosters scattered across the property. At least 200 of them were crowing incessantly. I recalled a superstition book I had as a kid, which claimed that if a rooster crowed at night, it meant death was approaching, a physical manifestation of death. My dad, a fighter and a rooster expert, had told me years before this incident that if a rooster crowed at night, it meant something was wandering among them. Whenever that happened, he'd grab his gun and often return with a mink, weasel, or snake. That night, with darkness enveloping everything and the rain pouring in sheets, you could hear the roosters calling out. I didn't say anything to my brother. He had no idea what it meant. Eventually, he fell asleep while I remained awake staring out that window until my parents finally returned home, complaining about the wet dog smell and shooing me away to sleep elsewhere. They asked what happened, and I quickly explained that Rufus got loose and I found him. They noticed the damaged door but thankfully didn't blame me for it. They attributed it to the storm. I thought that was the end of it, but the next day, my dad was furious, shouting about troublemakers roaming around in the rain. He had a severe case of paranoia, always thinking people were out to get him. I went outside to see what had happened, feeling whatever it was was more likely due to the storm than any person. He was upset because that bridge, the flat wooden plank, was completely smashed and splintered into pieces. Maybe a person could have destroyed it if they weighed 450 pounds, but the amount of broken wood and ragged edges looked like it was caused by a sledgehammer or a freakishly large beaver with anger issues. I never found the courage to tell him what I saw that night. There was no way to prove it. He was already a nervous wreck with serious paranoia, and I figured sharing the idea of a lurking dark evil coming from the mountain wouldn't be wise. Strange occurrences continued on that property for as long as we lived there, but I never saw that void again and that was probably for the best.